Hi, welcome to today's webinar, Normalising Mental Health Support in Organisations. I'm Brad Smith, a Health and Wellbeing Consultant at Westfield Health, and I'm also a Qualified Mental Health First Aider. So today we're joined by Cathy Lawson. Would you like to introduce yourself, Cathy? Morning, everybody. Great to be here. Cathy Lawson, Independent Workplace Health and Wellbeing Consultant, as it says, and also have been a Mental Health First Aid Instructor for some six years very passionate about mental health and reducing stigma and discrimination so really delighted to be here supporting westfield health great thank you and we also have richard holmes with us this morning would you like to introduce yourself richard yeah thanks bradley good morning everyone wonderful to i was going to say wonderful to see you but I, obviously i can't um <laughs> uh, director of well-being at westfield health which means that obviously i i manage uh, all our well-being services and, and mental health is a huge piece of, uh, of that work that we do. So really pleased to be here to be able to, to talk to you about it. Great, thank you both. Um, so first of all, just a little bit of housekeeping for this morning's webinar. So the webinar is being recorded and you will receive a recording shortly afterwards by email. Um, all attendees have joined in listen only mode, so if you do have any questions as we go along, you can type them into the chat function and we'll try and answer as many as we can. You should see a question section on your screen. You'll see some resources that you can download in the handout section. These include a resource for managers to support employees mental health, controlling worry and a poster for your employees with some advice for managing stress. During the webinar, we'll be asking some poll questions to include the audience members' experiences. The polls are all completely anonymous and optional, but we will share the overall results. And they're just a really interesting way to learn from your peers as well. A survey will appear on your screens at the end of the webinar, and it would be great if you could give your feedback as we use this when developing future webinars. So this week, it's Mental Health Awareness Week with the theme of anxiety. So anxiety is one of the most common mental health problems we can all face. But as we've only got 50 minutes today, our focus will be on the different ways that organisations can support their employees' mental health and how they can create a culture of wellbeing. So we've included some resources in the handout section with tips and advice for coping with stress, which you can share with your people. So a little bit about what we'll cover today. So we'll cover the importance of looking after employees' mental health, how you can create a wellbeing culture and drive cultural change within your organisation. We'll also have a look at ways that organisations can create a mentally healthy workplace. We'll have a look at some of the benefits of mental health first aid for your business and for your people as well, and how you can embed mental health first aid into your organisation. So just to set the scene, here are some of the key stats about mental health in the workplace. So a study by the CIPD found that 55 respondents who experienced depression in the previous 12 months said work contributed to it. Only 36% only of these chose to discuss it with their employer or line manager. According to the Health and Safety Executive in 21-22, 1.8 million working people were suffering with a work-related illness, of which 914,000 workers were suffering work-related stress, depression or anxiety. Westfield's recent survey on the attitudes of mental health found that the average days off due to mental health increased 4.8 days per employee in 2022. And this costs businesses around an 18, pound, uh, 18 billion pound mark. 30% 30, uh, 30 of respondents felt their mental health had worsened in the past year. And 51% said it impacted their productivity at work. And a third of respondents stated they have no support for well-being at work. So we've just shared some of the hard hitting stats about mental health and the impact it can have on work performance. So Richard, could you add to those and share some other reasons why it's important organisations look after and support employees' mental health? Well, Brad, I think first thing 
let's just all just consider those stats that are being set out there. Um, they, they've reflected research over the past three years, so it's, it's not new. These things are happening, and it's probably worth everybody on the call at the moment just having a moment to reflect on their own organisations and actually. Is that happening in our organisation? What impact is is that having on the ability of our business to do business? Let's just just have a think about that. Now, in terms of why organisations then invest in mental health, um, there's a whole host of reasons, and probably a lot of people will have heard about the benefits in relation to productivity, managing presence, managing absence, those kind of things, but. When we actually look at the research in terms of talking to clients about one thing, the number one reason is to do with employee relations. You know, it, this is what people now in the work expect from their employer. So if we're going to attract the same high quality staff, we've got to support them with things. This is what people are demanding. Now. Um, and then a lot of organizations will do it. Um, because they believe it's part of their duty of care. I know at Westfield, we have a fundamental belief that it, it's just the right thing to do. Yeah, there will be benefits for us, but fundamentally, this is our duty of care to look after our people. Kathy, any thoughts? Well, yeah, just to build on what you're saying, many of you may know it's not a legal requirement yet to have um, organisations focusing on mental health in the workplace. The HSC obviously looks at stress. They now um, have moved more towards looking at or including mental health in that as well. And there's been a, a move in the government. There was a law presented in January of this year to say we need this parity of esteem between physical health and mental health because, as Richard said, it's not just the right thing to do. It also affects the bottom line of your businesses to focus on people's mental health and. I know in my time I've worked with, uh, I remember district council, they had about 30 mental health first aiders in their organisation. They were tracking the conversations that they were having over about a year period. And of those conversations, they found that nine of those were, were people talking about suicide. And of that, there was one attempt and two people had a plan in place to actually end their life. So if ever there was a reason to think, well, this is a subject we really do need to, to consider. And the other side of that, that particular organisation looked at their stigma substance figures and for, in, in particular for depression, anxiety and mental health conditions and worked out that it reduced by having a concentration on well-being and mental health, it reduced their sickness substance by 59% which equated to a, a saving of £30,000 on the bottom line of their organisation. So, you know, there's the right thing to do. There's also a financial right thing to do and the, and the duty of care. So, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, so, we've just mentioned that there's still a stigma around talking about mental health. And a question uh, for you both would be, how can organisations begin to drive cultural change to create a well-being culture? Um, shall I jump in first? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the first thing I think to point out, and it's certainly been the case for us at, at, at Westfield, is to acknowledge that we don't change this overnight. This is a long-term initiative that you have to put up within your organisations. And the second thing I think we've learned from Westfield doing it ourselves is you'll only do this effectively if through the leadership in the organization. And I mean by that, you'll only drive culture change if the senior leaders of the organization are fully behind it and driving it. And that, that also feeds down through the line management structure. So it really is an organisational adoption of that culture uh, moving forward. And, you know, leaders have got to believe in the value of this. They've got to believe that this is the right thing to do. Because if our leaders aren't authentic, we're not going to follow them. And what we're trying to do just won't work. It will fall at the first hurdle. Now, 
just to reflect in terms of what we've done at Westfield here internally ourselves is, you know, at board level and all levels of the organisation, meetings, reports, everything, we always refer to the four C's, which is company, client, colleague, community. And colleagues are always central on the agenda of everything we're talking about. And they give an equal importance to the company performance, the client, because we know if our people aren't right, the business isn't going to be driven the right way. Um, and in terms of mental health, that that's a that's a part of that whole colleague people plan and, and strategy. And um, it's a fundamental belief that we have if we if we've got our people in the right place, and we're providing opportunities for them to talk about how they feel then we're starting to take that stigma away we're giving people and managers permission to say you know it's all right not to do that <laughs> and and it's all right to actually talk about it uh, in the same way that you would do if you couldn't come into work because you broke your leg we treat that same way as we would if somebody was feeling really, really anxious and, and they couldn't get out the front door. So it's about developing that feeling, that culture. You've got to build it slowly over time, I think, Kathy. Um, do you want to add? Do you want to add to yeah. Yes. Um, funny enough, I was I was delivering a course this week to an organisation, and uh, I won't say who it was, who it is, obviously, but they were saying that. Um, from the management, they were saying they were sending out a communication every week talking about well-being, and she said it was all it's all great, but it was it was received in a very patronising way because when you looked at the the back end of the processes within the organisation, they were not actually following it through. So it wasn't building a culture where, as Richard describes, it'd be great if people can come in and talk about their broken leg in the same way they talk about the depression and anxiety. And there was that disconnect between it being almost a tick box exercise, or oh, we think this is the right thing to do, so we'll, we'll send some communication out, but actually we've not done a bit more towards joining the dots. So, you know, organisations, as, as Richard said, these things are not going to change overnight, but what they can do, you know, maybe you've got a very male dominant, dominated organisation and you have, let's say you have regular toolbox talks. Well, just a tiny thing you can do is to start talking about this subject and slotting it in without making it a big deal, but starting to say, oh, how do you feel about this? Use the Use the feeling word. Let's talk about it and introduce it to the things that you do on a day to day basis, but make it real and make it genuine and make sure you mean it uh, when you are going to introduce these initiatives, because otherwise it doesn't change anything. You know, people just say, oh, I just feel patronised, you know, and they don't really don't really mean it. And, if, and as Richard said as well, of course, it does start with the management and make sure then the managers are aware that it's it's good it's best practice for them to look at supporting the well-being and mental health of their employees in the same way that they look at their performance and not to hide behind performance as well so yeah perfect thank you and um, so we will begin the first poll so i'm about to ask the panel for their suggestions on how organizations can support employee mental health but first we'd be interested to hear what our audience are already doing so here's the first poll please take a moment to answer and if you do have any initiatives in place already please put this in the comments section in the chat box and tell us what they are so we can share some ideas with the rest of the audience. So for poll one, do you have any initiatives in place to raise awareness of and support mental health in the workplace? So please either respond with yes, no, don't know, no, but we would like to know some more. Just give you a few minutes just to put your responses in there. I can see that we've got some responses coming through already. Okay. 
just a couple more seconds just to get the last responses through. I can see that most of you have been replying already. So from the responses, we can see already that some people have got mental health first aiders in place. Some organisations have been running mental health awareness sessions. Uh, so from the responses, we can see that 64% of uh, the audience have already got some initiatives in place. 7% have not got anything in place and 6% aren't sure if there's anything. 23% haven't got anything in place but would like to put something in place. Uh, so can I ask you, Richard and Cathy, what, what your initial thoughts are there? Is it is it kind of as expected? Yeah, I think from my perspective, yeah, very much as, a, uh, as expected. If we'd done this a couple of years ago, certainly the, the number declaring yes would be significantly lower. We've seen a huge uptake in organisations recognizing the need to, to address this um i think one of the key things that those that have done it and it'll be interesting to hear from people that have already done it how they've done it um i think we've got to recognize that for these types of things to be effective you've got to know and understand what your people want uh and how the best way of delivering it to it to them is that there's not one solution fits all organization by organization. Likewise, within your own organization, you'll have different employee groups, different maybe different restrictions because of work practices, that sort of thing in terms of how you engage with those people. So it's almost about finding the right mix of interventions and activities that will provide you with the best means of engaging the largest number of people. I mean, from a practical point of view, Bradley, you're out there with your clients all the time. What sorts of practical examples are you seeing working out there? Um, it, tying in quite nicely with quite a lot of the responses we've had from the audience, um, people have mentioned um, well-being champions which they've put in place within organizations and um, this is something that i have seen quite a lot of with clients as well uh, so within the organization they've got a, a lot of volunteers to be the well-being champions whether they've got a health cash plan in place which they can signpost to or whether the mental health first aid is again that can give signposting and um, it's quite nice at an, an employee level to have those champions somebody that a colleague can turn to for a bit of advice, a little bit of information. So I think quite a nice starting point can be champions to begin a bit of a culture with the um, well-being of employees. It's, it's interesting, just picking on what Richard, Richard said a minute ago, is that, you know, find out what your employees actually want as well and what is going to work for them. Don't put a pool table in if no one plays pool, because guess what? But it's not going to work, is it? So make sure you actually find what's going to be helpful. Some I've seen some organisations create well-being areas where they put a little quiet room in for people, and then fill it full of bean bags and books and um, apps that they can access, like little Headspace apps that they can take some time out just for ten minutes. So, but find out what is going to work for your employees because that's what will make the, the biggest difference. And then don't ask them and don't do anything. That's the worst thing you could do as well. Ask them and go, oh, we can't do that. No, if, you, if you're going to ask, make sure you're prepared to, to listen to the answers and act on them. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, so some great suggestions from the audience. Um, so Richard and Cathy, we've got just over 500 people uh, live on the webinar with us this morning. A uh, range of different industries, company sizes, a uh, range of wellbeing budgets as well. Um, could you both share some other suggestions on how organisations can support employee mental health? The obvious starting point, Richard, if I may, is obviously make sure that you've got some mental health first aiders in your organisation. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not a legal requirement yet, but it has. There was a campaign back in 2018, which some of you may have known, um, called "Where's Your Head At," 
back and that was built on in January of this year, it keeps going back to Parliament to say, come on, you know, we need this parity of esteem between physical and mental. So I suspect that's really welcome. Um, but if not sooner rather than later. And so it's it's um so it could become a legal requirement at the moment it's a recommendation as opposed to it being uh, legislation so you can have mental health first aiders in your first place in your workplace and think about how many people you've got and how many first aiders do you have which gives you an idea about how many mental health first aiders you would want then make sure that you are doing training for your managers as well you don't have to do full mental health first aid training you can do a half day awareness training you can do um short westfield have short webinars that you can um, use to raise awareness around mental health um what else can you do obviously you also want to think about the prevention as opposed to you know mental health that first aiders are often put in place when organizations think oh goodness we've got an issue here well what about preventing it in the first place and so make sure you've got your well-being initiatives in place as well um making sure that you're talking about sleep and diet and um, exercise or activity um so yeah there's lots of different areas that organizations can think about from a preventative I mean, Richard, what else would you add to that? I think the, the key point there is, is don't wait to react to problems. Look at how you can build that preventive program. Recognise as well, there's such a huge focus on mental health at the moment, but what we have to recognise is our, our physical and mental health are, are entwined together. You know, so if we're not physically fit, if we're not sleeping well, if we're not eating well, we don't cope as well mentally with, with challenges and, and pressures we have. Likewise, if our mental health is suffering, then we tend to stop exercising, we, we don't eat as well as we used to, we certainly don't sleep as well as we could do. So don't think about mental health just in terms of mental health, think about all other aspects of well-being that support people's mental well-being. Great, thanks, Richard. Um, so, Cathy, um, do you have any particular clients where you've seen certain requirements? Is, is there any specific needs that they're looking for in terms of uh, mental health support for employees? Well, I, I guess, as, as I was saying a minute ago, then um, what I see is organisations uh, considering that they need to have mental health first aiders, but I also see organisations sometimes using it as a tick box exercise and they send the wrong people for the training because they haven't considered who are the right people. They haven't asked them, do you want to be a mental health first aider? So that's obviously quite important. Um, so I think if organisations are going to make those investments, then make sure you have got the right people doing it. Um, if you want to train your managers, then again, make sure that you're selecting the right people for these roles and you can do some one day training for the managers that don't have to do a full immersion. Um, or you can do some awareness training. And so there are lots of options where you can get mental health and wellbeing on the agenda for everyone across the organization. So, so yeah, I think, um, I'm sort of repeating myself here, Brad, but yeah, for the same yeah. sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, um, ties in quite nicely uh, with the next question and the next poll. Um, so obviously, Kathy, being an independent mental health first aid instructor, uh, and you will lead a lot of the training courses for Westfield Health, um, I'd be interested to hear from our audience if you have any mental health first aiders in the business already. So again, just the same as before, if you could respond with either yes, no, don't know, or planning to in the future. And we'll just give you a few seconds just to put your responses in there. Uh, from your experience, uh, Kathy, what's your initial expectation? What what would you expect to see at this stage? Mm, uh, yeah, good, good question. I think that uh, given how busy I am, that actually 
many organizations now are really focusing on this topic. We saw with the poll before that many organizations have initiatives already in place. So I still do see companies that are, it's a bit of a tick box exercise and they're not, they haven't really embraced the whole point of it all. Um, but I, I am seeing way more organizations now, smaller SMEs to larger corporates that are really embracing this. And I think as well, bear in mind, we have a very discerning work, workforce now. And so they're looking for organizations that you know new recruits are looking for people who are investing in these areas and those are the companies that they want to go and work for so if you want to become that employer of choice then know that the people you're recruiting are probably going to be looking to you to see what you have in place from a, a mental health and well-being perspective so so yeah yeah, no, it's it's a really interesting, um, really interesting thought. Obviously, since uh, since especially since COVID as well, people are just looking for so much more from employment than just salary. The you know the expectations have changed. Like I say, a lot of people are going to be looking for organisations that have got mental health first aiders in place. Yeah. Um, so from the results, we can see 65% uh, have got mental health first aiders in the organisation already. 16% uh, don't have any mental health first aiders. 5% uh, are unsure if there's any within the workplace and 14% are planning to uh, in the future. So probably the results kind of as expected, would you, would you think, Cathy? Yeah, I do. I do think um, that it's very heartening, actually, to see such a, a high level. Um, I think many organisations also realise that they want to put mental health first aiders in place because otherwise there is um, an increased risk of grievances, um, claims around discrimination. And they also understand that when you're you're looking at people's well-being and mental health, then you're looking at their productivity, their effectiveness. The fact that they're not going to go off sick, sick if they feel valued, that they feel like with a mental health illness they can still be in the workplace, supported by their colleagues in the same way that you'd want to invite somebody back if they had a broken leg or if they had a you know, more serious illness. Um, if they're grappling with cancer, actually still being in the workplace can be a good place for people to be because it's very supportive and the workplace gives a lot of um, of those, you know, your hierarchy of needs, don't they? So I think it is a, a corporate social responsibility now. It is compliance as well is an issue here. So it's, um, yeah, I, it's good to see that people are making the investment, 65% of them are. And um, I think once you start that process, then it is going to, as we said earlier, that drip feed of changing the culture to one that's um that's a good place to work is a great place to work so attracting yeah, and retaining the right people yeah yeah i must admit i was i was quite surprised that it being as high as 65 percent but you know it's it's great to see um but just staying staying with you kathy so for those that are new to mental health first aid or perhaps they need to get a buy-in from any stakeholders um could you give us a bit of an insight on what the benefits of mental health first day training are for businesses and for the people as well? So you heard that little case study I gave you earlier about an organisation that had saved about £30,000. So it has a, a financial impact. Um, it does affect people's productivity. It affects their engagement. It affects their willingness to work there. Um, it, it's the uh, yeah about yeah the, the benefits are huge around um investing in this particular area and you can of course bear in mind you can start to measure these well-being initiatives and mental health um this initiatives that you put in place you can measure how many conversations you're having and that's obviously if you're doing it in a gdpr way you can still it's good practice to say how many people are talking about this subject in the same way that you would gather sickness absence figures for depression and anxiety. So you can measure your well-being initiatives to see what impact that it's having on your organisation. So, you know, I mean, Richard, do you want to build on any of what I'm saying there about why why companies want to invest in things like well-being and mental health? 
But I think a lot of that we've covered. I just wanted to touch back to what you were referring to in terms of the MHFAs, and, and particularly considering eight out of ten organisations that are represented on this call actually have MHFAs in place or are planning to do so. And I think one of the key big lessons we've learned at, at Westfield is it's not just about putting MHFAs in place and then it's job done. Uh, it's how do you continue to proactively get people to, to engage with that service that you've invested in. Um, one of the huge benefits we've found from having MHFA as part of the solution, not the solution, it, it's part of the mix of solutions that we, we provide our people to support them in their mental health is, you know, the ease of access for, for, for me as an individual, if I'm not feeling great, that I can just pick up a phone, click on Teams, and chat to a peer of mine that I trust because I know them. Uh, and I know it's gonna be confidential. It's different from going to HR, <laughs> uh, for example. Uh, and it also enables me to, to talk to someone about something that I wouldn't necessarily think is important enough to go to my line manager or HR about. But you know what, if I didn't talk about that now, what's the chance that it could then escalate over time and I end up to have that conversation with my line manager. So I think we should look at MHFA provision as both a preventative measure as well as they're purely to react to people's troubles and issues. You know, if, if we can get people talking as early as possible, then it acts as a, a preventative tool as well. And that's, I think, is the real benefit we've seen. But it, Part, it's part of our mental health strategy. It's not the only thing we do. And I think that's the key thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. You want to, you want prevention as well as uh, being there if, if people need support. So yeah, both are true. Great, thanks Richard. Um, sticking with you, Cathy. Uh, so in your experience, what makes for a good mental health first aid of what, what particular qualities should a, an employer be looking for? Oh, Brad, I'm so glad you've asked me that question because, <laughs> yeah, because um, there are things that you need. So first of all, let's pick people who are interested in mental health for a start, okay? It's quite a commitment to be a mental health first aider, so make sure they want to do it, they understand that it is a responsibility like it would be if you were a physical first aider. Um, make sure that you're picking people that are not currently overwhelmed by dealing with their own mental health issues because that's not necessarily going to help mental health first aid training is not about resolving their own personal mental health issues so what you often find is people have had issues in the past which helps them have a greater understanding and a greater em empathy towards other people they're probably perfect for the role but not if they're still in it because it's going to be overwhelming for them they're difficult topics to be talking about when you're talking about suicide and depression and anxiety so make sure make sure they're available to do the job but i have had somebody on a course who says well i work on a critical piece of machinery on my shop floor so actually i'm probably not the best person because if someone comes to talk to me i can't stop the machine in the same way that they wouldn't be the best person to be a physical first aider because if their machine's critical they can't suddenly switch it off and say yeah i'll be there in a sec so make sure people have availability have a good cross-section of people i've seen a company have all of their heart all of their hr people trained great but not everyone's going to want to go and talk to hr as richard said again you know pick the right person that you want to speak to that you trust so have a good cross-section that represents your workforce. If you have shift patterns, then select people in different shifts. So you're not just saying, oh, well, this is only for the, for the day workers. Um, oh my goodness, what else? So yeah, make sure they've got an interest, they're available, they can commit to the time, and they are a good representation of your workforce at all levels. Because remember, you might think, oh, well, I'll, I'll just have somebody on my shop floor. Or I'll just have somebody in my marketing department. But what about the very senior directors? They also want to talk about their mental health as well. So let's, you know, I've had 
CEOs and very senior directors on, on the courses as well, which is fantastic. That's a really good commitment from an organization to, to acknowledge and recognize that, you know, we can, we can cover everybody with yeah, this. Just, so. Add to that, Cathy, where, because this is a really interesting point, where you're talking about an organization selecting representatives from different parts of the business at different levels, that type of thing, complete, absolutely agree with. And then I think what's equally as important is then taking that selection process down to the individual. So what I mean by that is these roles, these are critical roles as part of a mental health strategy. Now, for other critical roles, for other functions within our organization, we don't just ask for volunteers. You know, we, we have rigorous selection processes for that. Now, quite often what we have to do because of everything you've mentioned, Kathy, is, is we have to ask who would like to volunteer to do this. Just because somebody's volunteered to do it doesn't necessarily make them an appropriate person to have as a mental health first aider. So as well as having a selection process which gives representation from various parts of, of your workforce, it's also critical then to say, right, now we've got those volunteers from those various parts of the business, are they the right people for us to use in terms of their skill set, their reputation within the business? You know, if they're, if they're known as a, a bit of a gossip, probably not the person as a mental health first aider. So I think we've just got to be a little bit sophisticated. It, it's easy just to get hold of the volunteers and then say, great, I've got them. But we just have to check that the individuals themselves are appropriate in terms of being seen as authentic and people of trust that people would go to. And also from something else you picked up on, Kathy, that somebody might be all those things, but if they're wanting to do it because they've primarily got a problem themselves, is it actually fair to put them in that situation? So I think the, there's considerations, a little bit more sophistication. Uh, we certainly found that at Westfield. We, you know, we, we realized when we first introduced mental health first aid, we hadn't perhaps been as robust as we should do. Uh, and we've learned from that, as we all do. Uh, yeah, so really key, really key, selecting the right yeah. people. And, and on that as well, Richard, there is a document that any of your clients can have access to, which tells them how to do exactly what you've just described. So if anybody wants that, then just get in touch and we can send that information across to you. That's a really important bit of information for people, definitely. <coughs> just adding in from, from my personal experience as being a being a consultant, going out to organisations and you know beginning to help with their wellbeing strategy. Uh, coming back to what you mentioned, Cathy, about not just treating it as a, a box ticking exercise, you, it's really important to make sure that the right person's being put forward for the role, for the right reasons, not just to tick a box, just to say we have this in place. So, um, yeah, I think good good comments all around, especially it is quite a big a big task finding the, the most appropriate uh, candidates to be the mental health first aiders but like I say we've got the resources there and um, some documentation which can help with the process as well and um, so coming to you Richard uh, once businesses have got mental health first aiders in place uh, what would then be your top tips for the organization I'm glad you asked me this this is a bit of a hobby horse of mine sorry about this but um one of the one of the things that I think we should, we need to do is we need to treat our group of NHFAers in our organisation uh, and afford them the importance of why we're investing in the first place. So as we would do with any other team that are in, delivering an important function and responsibility within the business, we don't just put them in place and then say, right, done it, <laughs> off you go. It's what we find really works well. Uh, we've certainly adopted it in-house. We've certainly, because of that experience and what we've seen with clients when we've advised them to do this, works really effectively is actually the MHFA should be a team. There should be a leader within that team. As a group, they should be meeting on a regular basis uh, to discuss what's working, what isn't working, 
to to be able to talk to people to each other in terms of well i had this situation how would you have dealt with it because i don't think i dealt with it as well as i could do so that you've got if you like that that continuous improvement principle working within that westfield team where the westfield team that medi that mhfa team you can build into that as well so if you like things like quarterly workshops where you formally get them together as well as their monthly catch-ups so that and and actually treat it as a, a business function that you would do with, with any team in terms of formal formal reviews and pushing through and then also what we found internally within westfield is providing that ongoing support to mhfas so you know for example, we put all ours through the refresher training that typically you, you'd normally advise to do every three years. So you're keeping them up to date with trends, you're investing in their training, you're investing in their development so that they can perform that function as, as well as they can. And there's another bit I think that's close to my heart, but I'll ask Kathy because it's close to her heart as well is, Kathy, who cares for the carers? Because we often yeah. forget about some of the pressures these MHFAs are on, situations they come across. So what, what, what are your thoughts in terms of how we then look after them to make sure they're in the best position to look after everyone else? Yeah, absolutely. And, and building on what you're saying earlier about creating a team of mental health first aiders that can support each other, that's great if you've got more than one, of course. Some companies are small and they only have maybe one or two. And what Mental Health First Aid England did is recognize actually themselves that they were training these mental health first aiders in all these great practical skills. But what was happening when the mental health first aider was having a really difficult conversation, perhaps about someone wanting to end their life? Who was supporting the mental health first aiders, the carers? And so what they did, they really launched the program last September with a much more increased emphasis on taking care of yourself. And there always has been a, um, a nod to self-care is self-preservation, but they've now put in place a support app, a mental health first aiders support app, which has loads of resources on it that mental health first aiders themselves, once they're trained, can access. It has webinars on there that are specifically geared toward this is how you develop your health and well-being and keep yourself safe. And you become part of this community of other mental health first aiders as well. So you're not just in your little microcosm of your organization, but you're also part of this network much broader of mental health first aiders so that you can um, reach out to other people and say, oh, you know what, I've had this really tough situation. How would you have dealt with that? Or can you just listen? I just want to offload here. So it's really important. And I think it's great that you can start it from an organizational point of view with a team supporting each other a much broader mental health first aid england now provide this support app for anyone who does the new course and also for anyone who does the refresher they also have access to this app as well and one other thing just to add richard in what you're what you're saying is that it's one of the things i've seen it's really important that you automatically legally have to have a health and safety policy that's not in question but do you have a well-being and mental health policy and strategy as well because if you don't that is also good practice because it takes the guesswork out of what you're doing to support your people so have a th if you haven't got it already really have a think about do we have a well-being policy and a strategy that supports well-being in the organization supports the mental health first aiders it clarifies if your mental health first aid is in support of them let's say they do have um a really a crisis where someone's saying you know what i've got a plan to end my life then what's the escalation process who do they go to who do they speak to so let's have this written down clearly in a strategy and policy so that people know what to do and how to deal with it because then you're protecting your mental health first aid as your carers which is where we started from so so yeah good stuff Great, thank you. Um, yeah, kind of just touching on with what um, Richard mentioned about um, with the mental health first aiders within an organisation, uh, catching up regularly, whether it be quarterly meetings, at the end of team meetings. Um, just from my experience, a lot of my clients have, have done very similar things. They'll have um, 
like coffee coffee mornings where the mental health first aiders will meet up discuss you know what what best practice is if, if there's been any issues that they've um, faced or found um, and it, it does does work really well and even just provides that little bit of support it can be a bit daunting for a mental health first aider thinking that they're in it themselves so it is always um good advice to try and catch up regularly with with colleagues i know it's something that we do at westfield as well a lot of my colleagues are uh, mental health first aid trained and we catch up quite regularly so yeah good advice to maybe have some team meetings some coffee mornings um, so we've had a really interesting session so far. Uh, we've covered on how you can begin to create a well-being culture, uh, the different ways to support mental health in the workplace, a little bit about how mental health first aid training can help businesses and employees and how to make the most out of that investment. So we're about to move on to some questions from the audience. Uh, so if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat. And I'd like to ask our panelists what one thing you would like to take the audience away from this session. Well, so I've got, got a question. Sorry, I was going to say, if I can go first, Bradley, it's just yeah, on yeah. book to finish. The, the one thing for me is make sure you look after the MA players. Because if you don't look after them, they can't look after the people. Definitely, definitely. What would your uh, main takeaway be, Cathy? can't do it in one word Brad but <laughs> I have to say that I think it's for organizations to take this subject seriously and to really consider you know put your mental health first aiders in place make sure you're taking care of them put your strategy in place and look at your well-being policy as well so you're looking at it as a holistic picture not just I know we've been talking about mental health first aiders but it's only part of the only part of the equation isn't it as well so let's look at the the broader picture as well yeah definitely and um, one of the first questions that's coming from the audience um which i guess you may be best to answer kathy is um as, as a recommendation if he was beginning to get some mental health first aiders in place who would you think the best role would be uh, for that would it be kind of an employee level hr level managerial level Easy answer to that one, Brad. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes, because as I said earlier, you want a good representation across your organization. So you want people from all levels in all areas because you know, you're gonna have people that don't wanna go and talk to their manager or they don't wanna go and talk to HR. There's still that, depending on the culture you've got, there's still that concern that if I talk to somebody, it'll end up on my HR record by the way that's not that's not legal you know you don't report personal information and put it on a hr record so you need to be clear that conversations that you're having with your mental health first aiders about, around well-being and mental health are confidential and the only time the only time that that confidence is broken is in the case of any risk to life of harm and self-harm and suicide so you know make sure if, if any advice as well make sure that everyone is clear what the role of the mental health first aider is there are boundaries to that role they are not counselors they're not therapists they're not a paramedic or a nurse or a doctor they are like a physical first aider um, make sure that they've got time to do the job and make sure that you are supporting them all the things that we've been saying we've been saying so far so yeah so yes yes and yes is the answer to that one brad great thank you um two questions that have come in that tie in quite nicely so the first one was how many mental health first aiders would you recommend at an organization with 30 staff and then another question that came in was roughly what percentage of mental health first aiders should we have within the organization i'm going to answer this in two ways because first of all think about how many physical first aiders you have you want to match, they don't have to be the same people, but you want to match that. So if you've got five mental, um, physical first aiders, let's have five mental health first aiders. And I think the last time I looked at health and safety, it was about one to 30, one to 50 people you would have um, a physical first aider. So let's make sure we've got at least one. I would always say have two, because then you've got support for each other as a minimum. And then the other side of the coin is 
if you have an organisation where you do have high levels of sit and substance due to depression, anxiety and other mental health issues, then maybe you need more across your organisation. So I think it's it's have a look at what's going on for your company to work out how many do you actually actually need. And Hopefully I would just add that, Bradley, for the, particularly for the, the, the individual that asked the question, the company with thir size of 30, the smaller you are, you probably need to have more than what would be the recommended ratio, um, simply because those people are going to be on holiday at some times, they may be off sick at some times, unavailable, so you just, you need that double cover. Uh, definitely, so definitely. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, another question that has just come in is, um, so one of the attendees works in a highly male dominated industry. They have mental health first aiders and often promote wellness initiatives. Uh, people are stressed, but they don't want to talk about it. The first aiders are not used. What can they do to change this or help promote the use of the mental health first aiders? Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. I, I work in a lot of companies that are very heavily male dominated. And I think it's about making sure you've selected the right people to be the mental health first aider. Because, like I say, it, if you can get somebody who is one of those males, then they're probably a better person to be the mental health first aider. Um, you have got as well something I often suggest to companies. You've got an organisation, obviously charity actually, called Andy's Man Club. Andy's Man Club is a charity that has, um, the, it's a charity that's, that's nationwide, so you'll have one in, somewhere in your area. And they often do weekly meetings where people can drop in on a Monday for some bizarre reason. But also they will come into the workplace and talk to your, to your male, to your men about mental health as well, specifically. So it's men talking to men often about their own experiences. So I think it makes it very real for them and gives them permission to to start talking about their own mental health and it is a bit of a drip 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 because we do know and this is not this is not a generalization this is factual that um men um historically haven't tended to talk about their feelings they haven't tended to open up um it's considered weak it's considered shameful it's considered uh, a vulnerability and it is working hard to keep breaking those stigmas down and sometimes you just have to talk about it as it is I know that you you might feel weak or, or shameful or you know vulnerable and and we're here to, to listen to you and it's just a, a question of chipping away at it really and it does work it does work if you can keep doing it but if it's not working at the moment then have a look at who you've got as your mental health first aiders have a look at how you're advertising them have a look at how um, you're promoting the conversation. So have you got a quiet area where people can talk that's not going to be a goldfish bowl and everyone's nudging everybody going, oh, what are they talking about? You know, do you, do you have a coffee area? Can you make it more informal? You've got to really think about your audience and what is going to work for them. And if something's not working, then think about it in a different way. So that's probably the best advice I can give, really. Yeah, no, great. Thanks, Cathy. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we're out of time. It's time to end the webinar so thank you uh, to everybody for taking the time to join this morning and thank you to the panelists as well for sharing their expertise um, and do apologize if we didn't get the chance to answer all questions but we'll do some follow-up blogs on our website to try and cover all of the common topics uh, please don't forget to download the handouts and we know that we've covered some sensitive issues today and we're sharing some mental health charities on the slide on the screen if you or someone you know is affected by what we've been discussing today. Uh, we'd appreciate your feedback via the survey that will appear on the screen and you'll also receive an email uh, with the webinar recording shortly. If you'd like to speak with our health and wellbeing consultants about supporting wellbeing in your organisation, please speak with your account manager if you have one. Or if not, you can contact us by email at businessinquiries at westfieldhealth.com. Thank you.